All right. Well, brothers and sisters, we're going to be, again, like I said, in the book of James tonight, continuing our study. But before we get started, let me let these people in. Before we get started, uh, do you mind joining me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is as your sons and daughters to, to come before your throne, uh, to request of you your help by your spirit in, in studying your word. And Lord, to know that, that whatever we ask according to your will, you, you grant. Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege that we have of this confidence in prayer, not because of our deserving, but because of your character, because of your generosity to bless for the glory of your holy name. Father, I, I pray as we study that you would give us wisdom, and Lord, that you would help us to see that, that as we lack wisdom, that you give generously to all without, without reproach. Lord, help us to, to be single-minded in our devotion to you as we come to you for help. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as is, as is tradition, we're going to start by reading through the whole of chapter one, just to remember where we are in context. Um, it can be easy if we just study a few verses to, to kind of forget that we're reading a whole letter. So it's helpful, uh, I think, to, to read the whole thing. Uh, so I'm going to read all of chapter one, starting in verse one. Read with me. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the, a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who rain, remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promises to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and, when sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before, the, before God the Father is this, to visit widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Well, the word of the Lord. We are going to be studying verses, hopefully, verses four, uh, sorry, five through uh, eight tonight. Um, but before we, we start looking at these verses, uh, I have a, a question. Can any rem anyone remember a time in their lives where they felt more clearly than maybe any other time, um, or certainly more clearly than normal, that you lacked wisdom in a certain situation? 
And what was that like? I remember, uh, well, there's been many times, <laughs> but uh, one of the earlier times that I remember was I was building cabinets for a hospital in Togo, Africa. And I was there to replace a couple, um, an experienced cabinet maker. I was only 21. Hmm. I was young. And I was there to basically finish the cabinets to, uh, to build a hospital. Hmm. And so I had to figure out how to convert all of the uh, metric wood into uh, standard measurements hmm. for building the cabinets. And I needed wisdom. Hmm. And I just remember uh, going before the Lord and saying, God, I need wisdom. I don't know how to do this. Hmm. And in the end, and, and there's a wonderful did. hospital. And of course, he did help me. And I built many cabinets and okay. completed my, my hmm. task. Hmm. Hmm. Praise God. Amen. Thanks for sharing, Andy. Anybody else, when they think of that, a time where they felt more clearly than, than other times in their life that they needed, desperately needed wisdom that they did not have? Uh, so, um, you know, as we... Uh, as we look to uh, adopt again, um, mm. how, how we approach that, um, especially knowing a little bit more of the process um, has, uh, has definitely required that we seek uh, the Lord's wisdom. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Elliot. It's very recent. Yeah. Current. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, Elliot. Mm. Yeah, I think of in my life, just a lot of, you know, various decisions uh, that I've had to make over the years. Uh, some of them obviously more important than others. Um, but yeah, you know, when we make some of these large decisions in lives, they feel like forks in the road that, uh, that you know, our life could go a very different direction depending on how we choose. Um, and in those moments, praying for, for wisdom and seeing how the Lord's provided. And some of those decisions, I, I don't know if it was the right decision. I don't know if it was a wise decision time might tell um but yeah this i think what we come to the text that we come to tonight uh is uh is encouragement for us to to seek wisdom from god uh but it's not just about wisdom it actually is is about so much more than just where we get wisdom it's a theology it's it's uh, encouragement to prayer uh it instructs us about the character of god uh, his nature that he is a generous giver and it's a, it teaches us about faith, the nature of true faith, what it looks like to, to trust God for who he is and what he has promised. So we're going to, I trust, see all that as we, we study in these verses tonight. And it's deeply applicable um, because so much of what we do in life requires wisdom that, that we don't have. Even if you have knowledge, um, that, that the way we apply that knowledge is beyond what we've experienced and we need, we need help to apply it. And so what we're going to see is that, that God gives wisdom in answer to those who pray uh, and those who pray in undivided faith. All right, so let's, let's pick up in verse 5. Uh, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. What word connects verses 4 and 5? Lacking. Lacking. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, so we, we noticed this last week, just highlighted again here, right? That we noticed that, um, that the goal of trials was steadfastness uh, and that we wanted our steadfastness. He, he encouraged us to let it have its full effect, leading to uh, perfection or maturity, completeness, lacking in nothing. But right in the next verse, he acknowledges that, that uh, these dispersed, Christians would lack wisdom. He acknowledges that they would, would lack wisdom. Um, so here he's pointing out, if you lack wisdom, we have to go to God. Let him ask God. 
So at the outset, I think it's, it's wise for us to define wisdom, lest we talk the whole night and not really know what we're talking about. So how would you guys define wisdom? What, what is wisdom? Whether it be how the Bible defines it or just how our world defines it, what is wisdom? Skill for living. Skill for living. Discernment. That's good. Discernment. Discernment, okay. direction, discernment. Direction. So particularly important in decision making, yeah. I'd say uh, knowledge with experience. Knowledge with experience, okay. Understanding. All right, Tammy says understanding. I think it's the application, the proper application of knowledge. Okay. Which said it's proper application of knowledge. John, what would happen? Well, how about this? Let me ask it this way. Proper according to who? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> proper according to God. Okay. Right. Proper according to God. So, yeah, there's a, a propriety we're talking about here with wisdom. So it's not just knowing things, but it's, it's application of knowledge. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, when we're talking about biblical wisdom, we're talking about what, what God decrees, what, what God calls us to do, to live in light of what God has decreed. So just at the outset, before we look more to James, I do want to consider um, some cross-references here, some, some places where the Bible defines wisdom for us, just so we're all on the same page. Um, we're going to first look at Proverbs 9.10. Proverbs 9.10. So turn with me if you would. Proverbs 9.10. And then whoever gets there first, please read it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, so this is a, a you know very famous verse. Uh, it's repeated elsewhere in Proverbs and in the Psalms that says that the the beginning of wisdom, where wisdom starts, is the fear of the Lord. What does it What does it mean in context to to fear the Lord? To hate evil. Hate evil. What else? That's good. That's Proverbs eight. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I was just saying that that's from Proverbs eight thirteen. Okay. Thank you. What were you saying, Tammy? Uh, respect. Respect for God. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other things come to mind? We think of fear of God, fear of Lord. Is justice. Yeah. Yeah, so when we fear God, we understand that, that he is just and that he will execute justice. Yeah. I think it also implies just an attitude in the heart of awe, of reverence, um, tied to what Tammy said with respect. Um, yeah, so actually that, that true wisdom, true biblical wisdom, as we're talking about it, is, is only possible for those who know the Lord and who know him in a, in a certain way of, of, of reverence, respect of those who hate evil, who, who uh, know his justice. Now, so all of these things that you've said um, remind us that, that wisdom is something that, that is uniquely available to those who are in relationship with God, who have been reconciled to God by faith. Um, that, that, yeah, that those who, maybe fear God outside of Christ, uh, fear him in a very different way than those who revere him, who, who have awe for him in Christ. So I think it's, it's really important for us to, to understand that at, right at the outset that the wisdom that the Bible talks about is, uh, is different from the wisdom of the world, uh, and it is, it is uniquely, uh, it is uniquely um, because we fear him, because we understand who he is and revere him. 
We're going to look at one other place in Proverbs before we turn back to James, just so we know what we're talking about. Proverbs 2. Oops. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6. So here, instead of seeing particularly um, its connection to the fear of the Lord, we're going to see how Proverbs encourages us to seek wisdom, how important it is. So uh, could someone read for us Proverbs 2, 1 through 6? My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Great. Thanks, Bill. So just a few things I want to highlight here before we get back to James. So, so first, where does wisdom, according to, to Proverbs 2, come from? Where does wisdom come from? God. God. Yeah, that's right. So it says here in verse 6, right? For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So we see these kind of parallel terms of knowledge, uh, understanding with wisdom. So it's from God. Uh, so that's going to really help us as we turn back to James from the Lord. Uh, the Lord gives wisdom. But also, uh, according to Proverbs, um, describe how, how we should seek it. How should we seek wisdom according to Proverbs 2? Like silver and hidden treasures. Okay. Yeah, so he uses this, uh, this metaphor of searching for it, like hidden treasures, seeking it like silver. So it implies that it's, it's precious, right? It's treasure. Uh, it has lots of value, all these things that treasure and, and silver have. What else does Proverbs 2 say about our, our seeking for it? You should uh, call out for insight, so you should be like asking for it purposefully. Okay. Yeah. So again, we have this, this term of calling out, raising your voice, um, which is what I, th I think we're going to see also in, in James. Um, yeah, so, so the implication is, I think sometimes that we think that wisdom is reserved for, uh, for uh, life experience or wisdom is something you get you know, with age or with proper training. But the picture that we get here is, is that, uh, first of all, it comes from God, it comes from the Lord, that he gives it. Um, and, and particularly, this is a father speaking to his son, right? My, my son, if you receive these words, treasure up these commandments within you. Um, so he's calling even the young to, to seek this wisdom. So this is not something just reserved for, for the old, um, not reserved for, for someone who has tons of life experience under the belt, though we can often tie wisdom to life experience, that really it's calling for, for all to, to seek, to call out, for, for raise your voice, to, to seek it from God. All right, well, <clears throat> with that under our belt, just kind of a, some understanding from the Old Testament of what wisdom is and, and how it calls us to seek it. Let's go back to James 1. And again, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So just to underline this, um, before we go, wisdom is not knowledge. It's not the same as knowledge. It means practically living out what is true in obedience to God, in fear of him. Uh, it involves insight into God and his purposes and his ways. It, it's a process, uh, or sorry, possessing it leads to, to spiritual maturity, right? So it's looking like discerning and carrying out God's will for us in whatever situation in life. All right, so how does James, if this is wisdom, how does James call us to seek wisdom, to, to find wisdom? Ask for it in faith from God. Okay. So we ask for it in faith. So we have this word ask. Asking God. Oops. Asking God. And then you're noticing here that this asking is in faith. So it's not just, just any asking. Uh, it's asking in faith. What are some, some synonyms, just to be clear here, what are some synonyms for that word ask? What does he mean when we say ask God? Prayer. Prayer. That's the, that's the simplest one. Yep. Petition. Petition, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, we see other uh, New Testament authors and, and speakers use the same idea of, of asking God, just a, a prayer, a petition, asking something from the Lord. So, so not all prayer is petition. Not all prayer is asking things of the Lord. But, but here he's, he's calling us in our prayer to, to ask something from, from God. And I just want to highlight here that, that um, as much as what trials bring, what we studied last week, this, this steadfastness that it produces in our life, and that steadfastness having its full effect of, of perfection, being complete, um, lacking nothing, that, that what he's drawing attention to here is that there's one lack that, that we have that cannot be made up by, by human effort, by, by trial, um, right? It's, it's a gift from God that, that must be asked of him. Um, no matter how hard we try to work toward this, this perfection, this maturity that, that James is calling us to, we, we cannot fill this lack of wisdom without God's generosity, without God giving it. This wisdom comes from him. There, there is no other source of it. Uh, this is what we see here, what we see in Proverbs. So the, the, the command here, right from the outset, if, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Let him ask God. And ask there is, is in the present tense, uh, maybe conveying um, or implying that this is a continuous ask. This is a continuous act. This isn't something we just do once. I lack wisdom. Uh, I'm going to ask him and, and be done with it. Um, but something that we continually do as we seek it like, like hidden treasures, we seek it like silver, something that we value continually. Thinking, All right. Go ahead. I was just thinking about, is there anyone who doesn't lack wisdom? Mm. You know, in, in, in relation to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, yeah. Um, lean not on your own understanding. He's calling us to. In all um, our ways. Mm -hmm, in everything we do. Yep. In all our ways acknowledge him. Yep. Lean not on our own understanding. So mm -hmm. really, it's a matter of realizing the fact that we lack wisdom. And not leaning upon what we think we have. The wisdom that we think we have yep but rather yeah. leaning upon god for that wisdom and understanding well said now this is true of everyone um maybe the only one we could say that that didn't lack wisdom is is jesus himself who who is paul says who is our wisdom um but even we even see jesus in his, his incarnation um, seeking the lord um and yeah, we we don't have uh, record of it but but even the night before he selected his his 12 apostles um spending the night in prayer we're not sure what exactly he prayed but yeah this this dependence on god was was even displayed by jesus in his incarnation okay so if if any of you in whatever situation you are lacks wisdom let him ask god pray request it from god but before he he says even more about that he's going to describe who this god is so what does verse 5, how does James describe God in verse 5? He's generous. He'll give it. He gives it generously. Okay. It and says. Reproach. Yep. It says he gives generously and he does so without reproach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does that, what does that word reproach mean? Judging or finding fault. Yeah, without without judging, without finding fault. Any other synonyms for that? Rebuking. Rebuking, yeah, rebuking or reproving. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say blaming. Reprove. I don't have space here. Blame. Why? Let's start, let's start at the end here, I guess, with, with our reproach. Why would a request for wisdom be met? Why would we connect those things? Why would he have to, to clarify that, no, God won't reprove us, reproach, when we ask for wisdom? I don't know. I kind of liken it to there's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay. <laughs> there is such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> no stupid question. <laughs> Kathy, as a teacher, says, yeah, I was going to say, yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, you know, um, God gave Solomon the wisdom, like he considered 
got a good request when when Solomon asked him for it, right? So like, yeah, that's good. He wants us to ask for. Hmm. Yeah, he he loved that request from Solomon so much that uh, with that request, with wisdom, he gave him everything else he might have asked for, riches and honor. Yeah, uh, the NLT sometimes is a helpful translation. It's a very very um, yeah, thought for thought translation, but here it says he will not rebuke you for asking. Um, so he will, he's not going to reprove us. He's not going to correct us. He's not going to judge us for lacking wisdom. He's I'm not going to be belittle. angry. No, yeah, no, no angry, no anger. Yeah, he's not going to belittle our stupidity, right? That, that actually this, this honors God when we, we acknowledge who we really are, lacking wisdom, and ask him because it acknowledges that he is the source of all wisdom. He has all wisdom. That's just a, a request that, that God loves to grant. And it's because, right, not only does it honor him, but because he is, as we've said, he's, he's generous. You know, in, in preparing for tonight, I just, I read that phrase uh, like 10 times just over and over. It's just, who, who gives generously to all, who gives generously to all, who gives. It's just, it's so encouraging um, yeah, to think of God as, as generous, that in his giving, he is not uh, begrudging, that he's not slow to give. And I, th I think this is even connected to, to the theme that we saw in our, our passage this week uh, when we studied Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. And we, we saw um, that Jesus in his teaching, um, calling us to be uh, like our Heavenly Father in his love of his enemies, that he points to the way that, that God sends, um, causes the, the sun to rise and sends rain on the, the evil and the good, on the just and unjust. Um, so just even that picture of God's generosity, that, that all of his creation get to enjoy sun and rain. So here he's, he's just grounding this in the nature of God, that, that God is in, in very important ways generous to, to, to all, right? That's what, that's what he says here, that God is generous to all. Uh, I, think, I think we can be... Um, careful about how we understand that meaning wisdom, right? What we, what we saw about wisdom, what it, what it is not everybody has access to God's wisdom, right? There are some fundamental things that, that need to be true of you to have wisdom from God. He is just grounding this in, in God's nature, that, that God by nature is generous to all, that, that he, he is good to all that he has made. And I think, yeah, it's, it's just rich to meditate on that idea of God's generosity. I think, Maybe um, for some of us, I, I know in my own life that, that often my conception of God uh, was that he was, he was begrudging in his giving. He was slow in his giving, um, that, um, yeah, that he really thought that I should, I should be able to figure it out on my own without, without his help. Um, so it's just really encouraging to, to think of God as, as generous. And, and obviously, there's, there's nowhere we, where we see this more clearly than at the cross, um, even as we thought about this this past weekend in, in the text that we saw on Sunday, that, that even when we were enemies, Christ died for us. So it's, it's not that his generosity is, is tied to our deserving uh, or, you know, that we have to have to be good enough to earn his generosity. Or, right. This is the, the good news of the, the gospel um, that, that he gave what is most precious to himself. That is his son. Um, that we have the hope then with Christ that how will he not with him also give us all things, including the wisdom that we need to, to navigate life in the fear of God, to, to live in accordance to his, his commands, his decrees, um, to live in a way that honors him. Now, he's not going to send his son and then withhold wisdom from us. He will give generously. Yeah, so I think it's just encouraging for us to pause and meditate on that. Because that's how James grounds his teaching here, right? That we can, we can be encouraged to ask God for wisdom because of who God is. Because God gives generously to all without reproach, without judging us. One way to, to say this is that, that God gives sincerely and without reservation. That God has a, a singleness of intent to give. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's rich as we, we think about God's giving uh, us wisdom as we ask. And then finally there in verse 5, um, there's a promise. There's a promise attached to this. What is the promise at the end of verse 5? It will be given. Okay, yeah. 
you'll you'll get what you you'll get you'll get what you ask for. Yep, you will get what you ask for. It will be given to him. And what is the it here? Just to be absolutely clear. Wisdom. <laughs> Wisdom. Yes. Yeah. So he's not here promising. Um, you know, whatever I ask for in prayer, I'll get. Oh man, how much I want a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. uh, God is generous. He gives to all without reproach. If I ask, he'll give it to me. No, he's, he's particularly talking about wisdom. And this wisdom that is rooted in a desire, a fear of the Lord that desires to, to honor God. Um, yeah, so I, I can just imagine there's situations where, where we think we might be asking God for wisdom. But really what we're, we're asking for is uh, yeah, something that, that, that God hates, you know, as, as Andy brought up. Um, this wisdom is a wisdom that hates evil. Um, so if I'm, I'm praying, Lord, give me wisdom um, to choose between, um, you know, stealing that or <clears throat> stealing that, right? That is not the, the kind of prayer that he's asking. That this, this God-honoring prayer for wisdom, um, the promise that we have attached to it is that, that this wisdom will be given him. It will be what he needs, not necessarily what he wants. That's right. That's right. So that won't be like a prosperity gospel. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and exactly. That's, that's why I point that out, Chris. Well said that, that verses, this verse and verses like it um, are often used by, by false teachers to promote something um, that says that, that in answer to these promises, God desires you to have physical prosperity, material wealth, um, even uh, outside of those things, um, uh, health. Uh, so even if it's not promising just just material prosperity, but but um, healing in a way that that God we understand does not promise in His Word. And I think just thinking in context, uh, James, we said you know right out of the gate there in verse two, talking about trials. Count all joy, brothers, when you meet trials. So I think particularly uh, how James is writing to uh, the Jewish Christians he, in the dispersion that I think particularly he, he thinks that they need wisdom to how to navigate their trials, how to navigate uh, the circumstances that, are, that they are in that are difficult. So knowing how to react and how to proceed in the, difficult, the difficulty of their trials. Um, specifically, as we think about uh, the rest of the letter, their unjust treatment by, um, by the rich who are oppressing them, who are bringing them to court. Um, it seems that the references later to landlords not not paying them their wages. Um, so particularly, we're thinking about wisdom and how to suffer well, how to suffer injustice uh, and oppression well. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so I just want to pause here as we got through verse five and, and ask um, even just more immediately. Um, we started by thinking about ways, times that we have thought uh, have felt really our need for um, for wisdom in, in particular ways. So I, I want to ask now, have, have any of you asked God, prayed a prayer like this to God lately? Um, and, and can you testify to how God has answered that? In our marriage, mm. find somebody that you... For all your observation and skill and understanding, uh, see as a potential mate, you develop a relationship that grows over time and you mm. love and affection. And then mm -hmm. you have a decision to make. Do I ask this person uh, to marry me mm. or not? Mm -hmm. And you ask for wisdom. You don't want to put, put anything between the two of you that destroys the relationship. You, have to, you have to do it with wisdom. Amen. Yeah, well said, Bill. There's so many principles uh, from God's word that, that we need to discern, work through in deciding to, to marry, who to marry, whether or not to marry, who to marry, um, when to marry. Yeah, lots of decisions. I would submit it's probably the second most important decision a person will make in their life mm -hmm. um, after following Jesus. Okay. So. Well, I feel like I, I asked for that many times a day mm -hmm. and so uh and, and you know god uh, there have been specific situations where i've had to make decisions or uh needed to have a challenging situation and god has come through every time but 
um, you know, in the sense of no, no stupid question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I probably ask if it was a human that I was asking, they'd probably be annoyed ah. at me. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that I lack wisdom <laughs> and that I need his wisdom. Yep. Amen. Yeah, the, the teachers and, and, well, parents, well, maybe everybody among us can testify how annoying questions get. But I, th I think that's the encouragement that we have in verse 5 is that, um, that he, he gives without reproach um, when we ask for wisdom. Um, but this is not something he's, he's annoyed by, a request that he loves to give. Yeah. I, would, I would humbly request, brothers and sisters, that you pray for your elders um, as we seek to lead, lead the church uh, to regather. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you all have, have, I hope you all have heard that our intent is this Sunday, May 31st, to, to regather in a modified way. Um, and, and all those modifications, we, we're not just picking up where we left off when we stopped on March 15th. Um, there are a lot of still um, requirements by local governing authorities, by national governing authorities, uh, that we just need wisdom, not only in, in how to follow them, but how we particularly apply them in, in our, our body, with, with our building, uh, with our resources, lots of, of decisions to make. So please pray for, for your elders as we make those decisions. Definitely. We know that God is generous. He will, he will give it. I, I would, outside of, of your own life, looking for wisdom, thinking particularly about church, about Stafford Baptist Church, about the brothers and sisters that we've covenanted together in membership, what are ways um, that you think we would, would benefit from praying for wisdom as we live as a body? What are areas that, that we think our body needs wisdom? Proper use of the resources God provides. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do, you, what do you mean, John? Well, the use of the buildings, use of mm -hmm. the, the finances that he provides for us, making sure that we're uh, focused on the things that he wants us focused on mm. you know, by using those resources properly mm. scripturally okay yeah well said john so yeah we have limited resources and this is this is god's good designed it but yeah he doesn't when we become a church give us an infinite money pot somewhere that would be terrible right that that what we are called to do is is steward what he has given us with wisdom um, and for a particular mission, uh, for a particular purpose, uh, you know, not for our entertainment, uh, not for our comfort, but for his glory. So how, how do we steward our finances? How do we steward our building or our property? Uh, yeah, the limited time that we have as a church together, how do we steward those things wisely? Any other ideas? What to teach, how to teach. I mean, it's endless. Okay, it is endless. What to teach and how to teach it? Okay. Yeah. And I think the church needs to have wisdom to be able to see the day approaching because mm. you, know, you just, I pray for that wisdom. I don't want to be deceived in any way. And, you know, there's so much going on. And I think, you know, it's, possible sometimes you know that you hear that the lord you read that the lord is coming back the lord is coming back the lord is coming back and we're eagerly waiting and eagerly waiting um but his time is different than our time mm -hmm. and, and we can get this you know you can get discouraged when you see mm. things that are going on in the world mm. so yeah. I pray, I pray for wisdom that you know the church the people god's people wake up and stay awake Amen. Well said, Tammy. Yes, yeah, so many of Jesus' parables about wisdom were about how we live in preparation for his coming, uh, that, that, that some people were not going to be ready because they did not live wisely. That's really well said that, that we have to, to, Martin Luther said it this way, right, that there are two days on my calendar, this day and that day, that just the, the idea that he's always getting ready for the second coming of Jesus, that he, he knew it could come at any moment and he wanted to always be ready for it. Well said. Yeah, there are lots of things that we, we can and should pray for as a body, um, not only for our individual wisdom, but for our corporate wisdom and how we live together. Um, I think uh, in addition to praying just in this season for how we, how we kind of roll out from the coronavirus, just understanding in 2020, we're going to have a, a presidential election. 
Uh, so not only as individuals, how we, how we discern our responsibility as uh, citizens of this, this earthly kingdom, America, how we steward our vote, but just how we as, as brothers and sisters love one another in the midst of divisive political times. Um, how yeah, more and more in the escalating uh, political world that, that it's easy to vilify and, and demonize political opponents and how uh, easy it is for that to affect the church. So just wisdom and how we, we navigate uh, elections, not only to love one another, but to be a witness to the watching world. Amen. And actually the way that we uh, are a display of Christ to the world is the way that we love one another, despite our differences. Well, lots there, but we have rich encouragement to pray because God is generous and that as we ask according to his will, this wisdom will be given us. But we have to go on. That's, that's not all he says about asking for wisdom. He's going to talk about the attitude that we have to ask with in verse 6. Uh, how we're to ask and how we're not to ask in verse 6. So first, in, in verse 6, how are we to ask? We pointed this out earlier, but just to bring it back, how are we to ask? In faith, believing. Okay. In faith, we hear, in, with believing. I uh, believing. Is that right? Nope. I can spell. Anyway, faith. Yes, ask with faith. And what are we not to ask with? Doubting. Yeah, without doubting. With no doubting. There's my highlighter here. No doubting. Okay. Uh, so before we go anywhere from here, we have to define what faith is. Um, if we need to ask in faith, we better make sure that we know what it is and we have it. <clears throat> so how does the Bible define faith? Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. Okay, so you're referencing Hebrews, Hebrews 11. Why don't we turn there? Because it's just such a great... <laughs> Great passage on the nature of faith. Hebrews 11, you know, uh, it's popularly called the Hall of Faith, right? Um, we have a whole chapter of the testimony of, of the faith of those who have gone before us. Um, you know, and, and at a point in this passage, he says, well, time doesn't permit for me to tell of, of all these others. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a picture of what faith looks like in very different circumstances. But verse 1 is a great uh, summary definition of, of what faith is. Can I have someone read? I mean, Andy just recited it for us, but can someone read for us Hebrews 11.1? 1? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Okay. All right. So in, so here with faith, he, he associates it with some other words. What words does he associate faith with here in verse 1? Assurance and conviction. Conviction. And what's a conviction? Doing something without doubt. Something without doubt. Okay. Without doubt. Yeah. So it's a strongly held belief. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not a belief you waver on. Mm -hmm. Okay. He also uses this word hoped. It's, it's uh, assurance of something hoped for. Uh, I think often we can use the, the term hope in a way that, that implies uh, that we're not certain of it. Um, you know, that I really hope I get, uh, I don't know, what do you want for your birthday? I hope I get a chocolate cake on my birthday. Um, pony. I hope I get a pony. There we go. I hope I get a pony for my birthday. That's something my daughter would ask for. All right, so that's often how we, we think of the word hope. But that is not typically how the Bible uses, uses the idea of hope. Uh, when it talks about things hoped for, it, it si simply is saying something that we're looking forward to in the future, something that we don't have yet. But in verse one here, it's, it's assurance. Faith is assurance of what we hope for. So what it means to have faith is not hope merely. It's, it's certain hope. It's biblical hope. It's hope that knows that what we are looking forward to is certain. It's, it's assurance of hope. Um, and it even is talking about... Um, so it says, you know, we're hoping in, in things, or sorry, we have assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. So again, that's just that it's parallel to this idea of hope for. So we don't see it yet. 
Um, we don't see all that God has promised for us yet. Uh, we, we might have a down payment of it. We see it in part, um, but we're waiting for the full consummation of it. Um, so yeah, I just, I just want to highlight here that, that faith, turning back to, to James, faith that he's talking about, faith that the Bible talks about, uh, is, is not um, kind of a, a blind faith or an, an empty faith, um, a faith without certainty. Indeed, the, the, the faith that, that James is talking about, um, as he says, with no doubting, uh, is, is certain. It's assurance. Uh, it is conviction of things not seen. And he goes on to describe, right, that that, that kind of faith, if, if it's true faith, it, it has no doubting. Uh, I think um, this potentially could be um, concerning for some people who would describe that they experience doubt. Um, I, I think maybe uh, knowing a little bit of what the Greek word implies here is helpful for us um, because we certainly see, uh, and we're going to look at some examples of this in the Bible here in a moment um, where people can have faith and in some sense have doubts, have questions. So I, I think we have to be careful here what he means by no doubting. So first of all, the, the Greek word here um, essentially means to differentiate. Um, and in the, the, the kind of voice that James, the, the kind of way that, that he uses in Greek here, the implication is it um, disputing with oneself. So at this, we have this image of, uh, of an internal conflict, like that we're divided inside of ourselves and there's an internal dispute. So that no, di no doubting um, is a dispute with, within oneself. So I think the implication is that it's, it's a particular kind of doubt, a strong kind of doubt. Uh, so this, this basic division within the believer uh, that, that brings out a kind of wavering and inconsistency of, of attitude toward God. This is, this is really similar to, to what Jesus taught, that, that we have to ask in faith without doubting. So I, I first want to look to show that, that this is not James making this up, um, that we have the same words from, from our Lord and Savior. Uh, so turn with me to Matthew 21. Uh, yeah. Matthew 21, verse 21. <clears throat> So here it's it's um, in the last last week of Jesus' life. He's he's entering into the, to Jerusalem, and he curses a fig tree, and the the disciples are amazed at it. And he teaches them about the power of prayer here in verses twenty one and twenty two. Can I have someone read those two verses for us? And Jesus answered them, "Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt." You will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Hmm. Amen. All right. So we see uh, some similar language there, right? He talks about uh, faith and, and not doubt. If you do not doubt, and he promises them that they, they will do the same. Um, as he has cursed this fig tree, that they will be able to do not only that, but even more, um, these, these great acts of faith, um, moving mountains. And then, yeah, verse 22 is conclusion. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So I just want to highlight there that, that Jesus teaches us much the same, that, um, that our asking in faith means, means not doubting. Uh, let's, let's, um, hmm. Just thinking about what are we asking for? You know, mm -hmm. what is the context of what James is saying there? He's saying asking God for wisdom and don't doubt that God will give you wisdom. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a little bit different than asking God for um, casting a mountain into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something I've ever been tempted to do specifically nope um but i've asked for wisdom many many times mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and so mm -hmm. i think you know the amount of faith it takes to uh to throw a mountain into the ocean is a little different than perhaps asking for wisdom in a given situation amen yes yeah, certainly what would uh, uh yeah i would argue what jesus's point there is is not uh literal uh right. we've had two thousand years of church history um some incredible men of faith who have incre prayed incredible prayers. 
and we have not seen mountains be moved into the Arctic Sea. This is this is typical. Oh, we have someone in the waiting room, sir. This is typical of um, Jesus' hyperbolic kind of um, <clears throat> uh, exaggerated language. Um, yeah, but he's he's making the point that that greater works will be done, right? That that this cursing of fig tree is a small thing. And I, I think really what he means is that um, who, who cares about cursing a fig tree, right? Like that, that you're going to pray and, and see um, uh, strongholds of Satan torn down by faith, that you're going to see people come to know Jesus in ways that, that uh, are amazing. Um, yeah, so these spiritual works that, that his disciples will do. Anyway. Well, we, there, there's another, another aspect I was thinking about too, and that is that, we know that if we ask according to his will, he hears us mm -hmm. and that he will answer us Yep. if Amen. we ask in faith, right? Yep. Well, we know, we know without doubt that it's his will for us to, to get wisdom from him. Yep. Amen. There is, there's never any doubt yep. that we need wisdom from him. We might have a doubt whether this particular mountain should be cast into the sea, yeah. but if God Amen. ever made that clear to us, yep. If God yeah. ever made it clear that this is my will for this mountain to be cast into the sea, just say the word. Okay, I'll say the word. And there Amen. it goes. Amen. Right? But I don't know that about a mountain, right? But I Amen. do know that about wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah, there, there are very few biblical commands or, or precepts that we should understand that, that disciples will be about mount moving, but, but abundant that we would be about living with wisdom. So well said, Andy. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to look at the rest of verse 6. Um, so we see that, that Jesus, too, uses this, this uh, language of faith and not doubting for our requests and prayer. <clears throat> James compares it. He, he loves using, we'll see lots of these metaphors, these word images, um, to compare what it's like to ask with doubting. And he compares it to a wave, right? He says, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. What's this wave like? It's, it's driven and tossed by the wind. Um, so, so have, has any has anybody spent much time at sea? Do we have any sailors among us? Paul's a sailor. Paul's a sailor. Well, he raised his hand, but yeah. just I spent a couple months out at sea once. Wow, months! I'm pretty sure you have the most experience among us then. I'm a tuna boat. <clears throat> How stable is the surface of the sea? Not very stable. Yeah, not very stable. Uh, you can ask my wife. Uh, I do not do well on, on even protected bays of the sea, uh, let alone if I got out into the open ocean um, that's not protected by, you know, huge land masses and all that. <laughs> right? The, 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 the sea is just constantly shifting. It, it is never uh, flat glass, right? Um, there's so many forces at work in, uh, in the, the ocean to make it just a turbulent place of, of chaos, right? Even when they're not storms, but then add in add in terrible storms and hurricanes and monsoons and right the the sea can be a terrible place to be. <clears throat> um, but but even here, the, the picture is not necessarily the storm toss wave. It's just a wave that, that's being pushed around by the wind, the wind that, that's constantly blowing over over the ocean, right? Um, the the swells of the sea never having the same texture or shape, right? They're they're constantly being reformed from moment to, to moment, always changing with, with variation in wind direction, with the, with, you know, the, the movement of, of um, these great tides and uh, yeah, the movements of the, of the ocean, right? That the waves are never at peace, never not moving. So that's, that's the image we have of, of, of the, that this wave just at the mercy of the ocean moving and, and being tossed to and from. Um, that's what he says that, that this man who, who doubts is like. Always, always changing, never, never steady in his trust in God. Um, <clears throat> I do, I do want to look at one example of this from Scripture of what this kind of faith and, and doubting look like. Um, and I, I want to use Paul's discussion of, of Abraham in Romans 4, and then we're going to go from Romans 4 to, to Genesis 15. Because um, Romans, Paul uses the same exact word of, of doubting here, this, this word that's translated doubting. He uses it in Romans 4. Uh, so turn with me to Romans 4. Do, 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 do. Romans 4 and verse 20. 
if I recall, speaking of Abraham's faith. Yep, verse 20. Yep, okay. So let's read 19 and through 21. Just the context there. Romans 4, 19 through 21. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. For when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb, no one belief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Mo. So yeah, I just want to point out, uh, again, this is a wonderful picture of Abraham's faith and, and how steady it was. Um, but but you don't see that word doubt show up here, but, uh, <clears throat> but in... In the Greek, this word translated here in verse 20 as waver, that's the same word that we see show up in, John, in James 1, 6 as doubt. And here it says, no unbelief made Abraham waver. No unbelief made, um, made Abraham doubt concerning the promises of God. But he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God. So just things to point out, right, that, that um, this undoubting or this doubting, wavering is, is contrasted to unbelief. Um, but there's a growth in his faith, right? It's not a perfect faith, right? It says that he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So I don't think it's an implying a, a perfection of faith. But but I, I want to go back and, and like actually look at what did Abraham's faith look like uh, and, and make sure that we can understand that, that even if you have questions of God, that doesn't mean you're wavering or doubting uh, in the way that James uses it. So... Uh, the last stop on, on this journey, we're going to turn to Genesis 15. <clears throat> Genesis 15, read the first few verses there. But <clears throat> before I read Genesis 15, Genesis 15 is after Genesis 12. <clears throat> Genesis 12 is when Abraham receives the covenant uh, and the promise from God, the promise from God that his descendants would be numerous, that he'd, he'd be the father of, of numerous descendants, uh, father of numerous descendants. But we get to Genesis 15, and, and he hasn't seen that happen yet. He doesn't have any children. So let's read uh, Genesis 1, or sorry, Genesis 15, 1 through, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Yeah, so again, I think this is helpful for us, for us in understanding um, the kind of, of faith that James is talking about, um, that Paul is talking about in Romans 4, right? That, that Abram has received the promise from God called out of, of the Chaldeans to, to be his, his chosen um, nation, father of the nation. But here in Genesis 15, he hasn't seen that happen, um, right? That, that Abraham's just waiting and waiting. And Abraham has a question for God, right? That's what, what happens in, in verse 2. Um, after God says again, I, your reward will be really great, uh, very great, Abraham says, Abraham says, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So, so he has this, this question, this genuine question for the Lord. I, I don't have an heir yet. How can I be father of nations? Um, and, and again, God reiterates his promise. Um, you know, you will, you will have a child. It says your very own son shall be your heir. Uh, and then he takes him outside and shows him the stars, right? Now, that's how many descendants he will have. What a wonderful promise. And, uh, you know, we read verse 6 there, which we, we all know well, right, that, that this faith by, by the Lord was counted to him, credited to him as righteousness, that by, by faith, Abraham was made righteous before God. 
so wonderful, wonderful passage, rich passage. But it highlights for us just the fact that, that I think what James is talking about, what, what uh, Paul is talking about in Romans 4, is that this faith can include questions. Um, and those questions can be very hard questions. Um, we can keep going in the story of Abraham. After this, we get to Genesis 18, and, and God asks, or sorry, Abram asks, God, many questions in interceding for Lot. Will you destroy it for 50 righteous for, you know, he goes on and on. So I, I don't think that what James is talking about, what, what Paul's talking about, uh, what we see in the example of Abram is that this faith means no questions or no doubts at all. Um, what what the, the doubting that I think James has in mind um, is, is this divided mind, um, a mind that, that um, believes God, uh, you know, with, with half your tongue, but the other tongue, uh, does not believe in God. Um, it's, it's a more, um, uh, uh, more, uh, deep conviction of, of unbelief in, uh, on, in God. I think the, I like how the, um, the Greek word has a dispute within yourself. Yep. Abram, Abram is looking at the circumstance in front of him. He mm -hmm. still trusts God, yep. but it's looking at it. And if you look at the, the different situations, it's when we're looking at our own situation and not the character of God. Mm. It, that's the, the faith is let. It doesn't mean we haven't had faith in the Lord, but at that moment we are looking that dispute within mm -hmm. back to that Greek word. It's looking yep. at the situation and here's what's ABC before us. And we're not looking at the and trusting in the full character of God and Amen. what he will do. So, Amen. Well said. Yeah. I, I definitely want to, we'll, we'll end here and I just want to ease, ease consciences. Um, as, as we think about this, I, I, I hope that, that you are all, um, yeah, rejoicing in the faith that, that God has given you. We, we all recognize that our faith is, is growing, um, that, that it isn't what it, can be and it's not yet what it will be as as we grow by god's grace remember what we studied last week verses two through four right this great principle that our faith is tested that, that we have genuine faith um, but what it means to be loved by the lord in his discipline is to have our faith uh, shown um, to be true in in testing in uh, the work of that testing produces greater faith a, a, a faith that is steadfast um, so I, I, I want to ease consciousness that, that just because you think that, oh, my, my faith uh, wavers um, in some sense, I don't think it's the wavering that, that he has in, in mind here. Um, yeah, that, that if we cling to Christ, if our, if our hope is in him, this is what we thought about the true nature of faith. If, if we have conviction of things not seen, if we have assurance of what we've hoped for in Christ, Right, then that we have, have this faith and we have the promise that, that God gives generously to all who, who ask, and that we can, we can trust him to give that to us. Um, we'll, we'll continue studying, finish out verses 7 and 8 uh, next week, um, but I do just want to conclude um, yeah, with, with a, a quick question um, as we, we think about this. If there are other, th other ways um, that you guys are... are um, yeah, thinking about how uh, the, the promise of God's generosity and giving an answer to prayer prompts you not just to pray for, for wisdom in various situations of wisdom, but just, yeah, encourages us to pray uh, in other ways that, that y'all are feeling you need, need prayer in this season. That question was unclear to me. Can I, can you rephrase it? Yeah, I have to, I have to correct Andy. There are stupid questions. This uh, was that one. Uh, yeah. So basically, yeah. So, so the encouragement here is, is particularly uh, asking for, for wisdom, but I just want to draw, draw it and take a step back and just thinking about the character of God, that he's generous in answer to prayer. Um, that as we ask according to faith that he will answer our prayer. So just even outside of wisdom that, I was asking, what are ways that, that you guys feel moved thinking about God's generosity and promise to answer prayer? What are ways that you guys feel moved to, to pray in response to this study? 
uh, neither Lois or I will be in church on Sunday mm. because I have various issues with autoimmune diseases. Mm. Uh, diabetes being one of them. Um, but I think that the planning that's gone into the restoration of service at the church, um, that's something we ought to keep in mind because mm -hmm. there'll be evidence of how successful uh, it is that uh, plan that you've developed together with the uh, other, uh, with, with the men of the church. And we ought to follow the rules and do mm -hmm. what we're supposed to do. And if it's God's good wisdom that nobody catches anything along the way, that would be, that would be good. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, that's a great prayer. Prayer for protection as, as we gather. Mm. Yeah. I'll, I'll submit that I, I was provoked in my study to be consistent in prayer for evangelism opportunities for open doors for the gospel. Uh, Certainly, it's it's had its unique challenges in this season of coronavirus, um, where we even we felt like neighbors have have tried to engage us in relationship, um, but sometimes in ways that we thought would were inappropriate um, during the pandemic. So just yeah, prayer for 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 open doors, and that um, you know a lot of times open doors are before us and we don't even see them. Mm -hmm. So just asking the Lord, being consistent, and asking the Lord to give me uh, yeah, His eyes. Uh, to put it that way, just a, a eternal perspective on the people that are around me day in and day out. Yeah, that's a good one. In a way, that's really asking for wisdom. Mm -hmm. You're right, it is. Maybe most things can be described as wisdom, yeah. <laughs> wisdom for what to pray for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But we know we always need we all, we know we always need wisdom. So, amen. amen. Well, we've uh, we've gone overdue. Let me close us in prayer and ask the Lord to grant us all wisdom, uh, knowing that He is generous to give it. Let's pray. Father, uh, yeah, as we've, we've thought about tonight, um, prompted by Your Word, that, that we do confess that that all of us lack wisdom in in innumerable ways. Lord, in, in more ways than we even know. Father, it is, it is your kindness to us to reveal our lack of wisdom. Father, it is, it is to our great danger that we live not in the fear of you, but, um, but pretending, but thinking that, that we know how best to, to manage our own lives, to make decisions. So, Lord, we, we do pray that you would yeah, show us kindly, convict us by your spirit of our lack of wisdom, Lord, we do pray that, that you who are generous, you who abundantly give, not begrudgingly, but, but kindly for your own glory's sake, that you would grant us wisdom. Use so many means, Father. Use your word. Lord, use the counsel of brothers and sisters. Uh, use even governing authorities. Use so many things, Father, to, to give to your people wisdom, to give to us as Stafford Baptist Church wisdom, to give to each of us as individuals wisdom in the various ways that we are called to live for your glory's sake in the hours and, and days and weeks ahead. Father, we, we desire to live the wise life that your, your word calls us to. Lord, for we know that it brings true prosperity to us and, and glory to your name. Lord, do all this and abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.